Um, so, next up we have Maren McLeod. Uh, Maren actually got me my first Rails job back in 2014. Uh, so, thank you for introducing me to this community. Uh, so, Maren is secretly an Australian or secretly a New Zealander, depending on which way your preferences sway. Um, <laughs> oh. Uh, so she was a founding member of Ruby New Zealand, where she served on the committee for three years, um, and she co-ran the first Rails Girls workshops in Wellington, and she co-founded the Kiwi Ruby conference as well with me and some others. Um, in her spare time, she likes to paint human butts and vegetables with legs. You can see some of them on her Instagram. Um, and she's also recently been quite sad about man-made climate change. Uh, she's previously worked with Code for Australia doing um, interactive weather prediction tools for the Victorian government around bushfires, and she's also worked in the electricity industry in New Zealand. And big round of applause for Mary McLeod, our last speaker of the day. So... Uh I'll start with a fun anecdote, because this is going to be pretty bleak. Uh, <laughs> so when I was a teenager, uh, a boy asked me out on a date to the movies, and he asked me to pick a movie that I was interested in watching. I picked uh, An Inconvenient Truth. <laughs> it's not a good date movie. <laughs> there was no second date. <laughs> So there's a lot of ways in which we affect the environment around us with the way that we live and the work that we do. Today, I'm going to focus on one particular issue, which you might know as global warming, you might know as climate change or the greenhouse effect. And this talk was particularly inspired by the IPCC's 1.5 degree report, which I do recommend that you read. So I'm not going to uh, reiterate all of an inconvenient truth, all the various uh, uh, ways that, that you probably already know about this, but the world is getting warmer. Many of you will have seen this graph or something like it. Each bar is a country. Uh, if, if it's blue, the year in the middle was colder than average, and if it's red, then it was hotter than average. There's always been variation in the weather. There have been hot years and cold years, but the cold years have been getting warmer and rarer, and the hot years have been getting hotter and more common all across the world. Australia has just seen its hottest January on record with records broken across the country. And it's getting warmer because of people. This increase in temperature is mostly because of greenhouse gas emissions. The sun's been pretty chilled out over the last 100 years. It doesn't match volcanic activity. It's, it's mostly because of, of our activities. And it's bad. There's many different impacts from global warming with different levels of likeliness and badness to uh, call back to, to Daniel Fone's talk. Sea level rise is going to cause displacement from low-lying areas, and we're already seeing insurance retreat from those coastal communities. Rapid temperature changes uh, will upend natural ecosystems, and we're already seeing things like coral bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef and some places where people have lived for a long time will become unlivable. We've missed the window to avoid these outcomes altogether. They're happening, they're going to keep happening. But we can do something about it. We can keep a lid on it if we make drastic changes quickly. These are facts, but I'm going to acknowledge quickly that some people aren't convinced. In 2014, CSIRO asked Australians to guess how many, uh, how many other Australians they thought didn't believe in climate change. On average, they guessed about 22% when it's actually, it was actually about 11%. So it's probably fewer than you think. And I'm not here to convince that minority. I'm here to talk about what we can do about it. So what I'm going to talk about is how our industry contributes to climate change, both, both positively and negatively. And I'm going to talk about how we, in our roles as software developers and tech people, can do something about this. I'm not going to talk too much about the, change, the choices that you make in your private life. There's plenty of other places that you can learn about that. So how does our industry 
information technology contribute to climate change? IT causes about 2% of the world's emissions. This is a total made up of data centers, voice and data network infrastructure, and running devices. These uh, numbers are measured in gigatons. Data, data center emissions, which are probably the part that we contribute most significantly to as software developers, uh, they've been growing significantly every year. But global data centers capacity has been growing much more quickly. The industry has been moving towards using enormous data centers maintained by organizations like Amazon and Google, where they're incentivized to improve their efficiency. So these numbers are enormous. How do the decisions that we make at work contribute to it? First, I'll give you a couple of reference points for how greenhouse gases are emitted. Each kilowatt hour that you use in Victoria emits about 700 grams of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This changes depending on the particular generation mix. So sometimes you'll import hydroelectricity from Tasmania, or wind electricity from South Australia, or more coal electricity from New South Wales. When you drive one kilometre, depending on the type of car that you're in, you'll emit about 500 grams of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. I'm assuming a well-maintained mid-range car here, but it can change a little bit. And most of us don't work directly with cheese, but I'm going to use it to visualise some of these emissions. So making a kilo of hard cheese results in the emissions of about 10 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent. That's mostly methane emitted by cows. Methane is a much more effective greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, although it breaks down into carbon dioxide in the atmosphere after about 20 years. I'd like to highlight that Australia's carbon intensity for electricity is unusually high, particularly on the East Coast, because of its reliance on coal. So New Zealand averages at about 120 grams, California at about 250, and France at about 54. Queensland often gets closer to 800. So I'm going to do, go through a couple of examples of things that we do in our work that result in emissions. First of all, have a guess at how much a big grunty desktop machine drawing a kilowatt would emit in 24 hours if it was plugged in in Sydney. Those of you who took notes on the previous slides may have done the maths. It's 16.8 kilograms. That's the equivalent of, of uh, 1.68 kilograms of cheese or driving from here to the airport. Many of us use MacBook Pros. Apple have put out an estimate of the carbon cost of each of these machines, including an estimate for its use for four years. Have a guess at what it might be. Hold that in your mind for a moment. It's about 450 kilograms. That's the equivalent of driving from here to Sydney. So it's a reasonably big chunk, but if it's spread out over four or five years, it's not too bad. Many of us travel between cities as part of our work, whether that's for sales or, for, or to go to events like this. Flying return between Sydney and Melbourne emits about 148 gram, uh, kilograms of carbon dioxide. That's the equivalent of nearly 15 kilograms of cheese, which I think is about how much Ruby New Zealand bought for a rails camp at Mount Cheeseman once. <laughs> Good time. How much do you think one Bitcoin transaction emits? <laughs> some of you, judging by the response, probably some of you know that it's a lot. <laughs> so this is me sending you a Bitcoin, or buying a pizza, or buying passwords off the dark web, or whatever else people do with Bitcoin. Each Bitcoin transaction emits about 205 kilograms of carbon dioxide, and this varies depending on effectively depending on the price, so it's much higher when there's more miners in the network. If you're thinking that seems like an obscene amount, you're not wrong. It's about the same amount as dri driving to Wagga Wagga. The Bitcoin and net network in total emits about 22 million tonnes of carbon dioxide every year. This is because it uses a thing called proof of work to put blocks on the blockchain and all of the computers on the network are competing to guess the same random numbers 
any proof of work cryptocurrency has exactly the same problem. Although if the network is smaller, then it won't be as significant an emission for every transaction. How much do you think the net emissions for a Google Cloud platform computer for a year are? Uh, so they offset their emissions, so it's net, net zero, no cheese. Uh, how about an AWS T2, EC2, uh, T2 large EC2 instance in Sydney for a year? And this is um, just a disclaimer here, these are numbers that um, they don't release and I've um, put together based on the, uh, the hardware information that they do release and an average uh, electricity intensity uh, numbers for Sydney. So do remember that Australia has some of the dirtiest electricity in the developed world. So most other regions will have much lower emissions. So this seems like a lot, but sometimes the work that we do, even though it causes emissions, also enables reductions in emissions in other parts of, of the economy. Software often results in more efficient uses of resources. Tech's an important part of adaptation to a low carbon economy. The work we do reduces paper waste and it reduces the need for travel, travel and physically sending information from one place to another. So how can we use our sweet computer skills to help this terrible problem? Now we can re reduce emissions of other sectors. We can use our tech skills to help society adapt to the needs that we're going to have over the rest of the century. There's a good chance that the work you do already contributes to this. So there's things like modernizing electricity grids so that they can deal with uh, renewables and uh, using energy more efficiently, smart buildings and Internet of Things stuff, using heaters and coolers only when they're, only when they're needed. Transport is one of the biggest causes of greenhouse gas emissions and there's a number of ways in which software can help the sector improve, like improving the efficiency of personal transport and logistics. Telepresence tools are also a significant way that we can help other industries reduce their impact. We can help them reduce transport emissions, in particular aviation emissions, creating tools that allow people to have meaningful discussions and connections over the internet means that people don't need to fly. Things like online conferences can reduce massive, uh, save massive amounts of emissions. And we can mitigate our own emissions. We can influence our companies and the industry at large to mitigate their emissions. There are th three things involved with this, reporting, reducing, and offsetting. The first step is to count emissions and report them publicly if possible. If any of you have tried to uh, improve the speed or the number of uh, errors in your applications, you'll know that you can't improve what you don't measure. You may not realize what the biggest contributors to your emissions are, and if you don't count it, you might end up spending a lot of effort on improving something that doesn't contribute that much. The standard protocol for, reducing, uh, for reporting your green, company's greenhouse gas emissions is called the GHG protocol, and it separates things into three scopes. The first one is called the scope one, and that's for direct, direct emissions. So that's things like company cars or fuel that you burn directly. If you're directly burning coal as part of your business, then uh, I suspect that most of us aren't, but that would go in there. Scope two is the use of electricity. Uh, so this is where you'd get out your um, electricity bill for your office and count it up against the um, numbers for, for, for the electricity. And scope three is other indirect emissions. There's a lot of discretion about what to include in scope three. You should definitely include business travel. Uh, you might want to include employee commuting. And I think that you should probably include cloud hosting. If you accept cryptocurrency, this would be the section to put the carbon cost of those transactions. The official guidance is to include anything that's likely to be large compared to the rest of your emissions. For example, IKEA decided to include customer journeys as part of their carbon footprint. With large EC2 instances on AWS uh, in Sydney, probably contributing 
uh, over a ton a year, whether that's a large part of your emissions is really dependent on your business. So that's all very well if you can do it, but not all of us can get the buy-in to do that straight away. So here's some ways to start small. Count whatever you have the data for, and maybe you can sneak estimated CO2 emissions into your everyday metrics. If you don't have data, you can start putting some together. Maybe you could survey your team on their commutes and put something together. You could also passive aggressively label everything. No. <laughs> don't do this. Don't blame me if your coworkers do this. So once you know the most significant parts of your organization's carbon footprint, you can work on reducing them. It's reasonably likely that your biggest contribution is air travel. You don't have to cut this out altogether, but if you're flying to the same city more than once a month or so, consider taking fewer, longer trips. Set timers on motion, or motion sensors on your air conditioners and lights. Use more efficient appliances. And try to use more carbon neutral hosting. So uh, with Australian customers, you'll probably want to use the Sydney zone for anything customer facing. But can you use carbon neutral zones uh, for some of your background tasks? When you're picking your office location or where to have a retreat for your remote team, think about the carbon costs of that travel. And finally, I'll remind you that every single transaction with Bitcoin results in emissions of over 200 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent. If you accept it as a payment and take one transaction a week, that's 11 tons a year. If you do anything with Bitcoin, stopping that is probably the best thing that you can do for your carbon footprint. Once you've counted your emissions, you may then want to be able to say that you're carbon neutral or carbon zero by purchasing some offsets. They're not that expensive, but they come at varying qualities. So there's a few things that you consider when you're picking which offset to purchase. Uh, consider the permanence, whether this offset is lasting. So if you buy shares in a plantation forest that's going to be cut down for paper in 20 years, you're not really offsetting the lasting effect of your emissions. Consider whether it's actually doing something extra with the change that your offset purchase is causing have happened even without your, your, inter your purchase. And consider leakage. Would protection of one area lead to deforestation somewhere else? Stripe has written up a great piece about how they chose their offsets. Uh, they ended up buying offsets from a landfill methane flaring project. Uh, so again, not all of us uh, have the buy-in to do this from the top, but we can do a little bit of undercover offsetting. Uh, if you're given the office credit card to buy flights, buy an offset when you buy flights. There's a checkbox on a lot of, um, a lot of air, air, air travel pro providers, and it's not expensive. It adds about $2 to a ret return trip between Sydney and Melbourne. I offset my flights here and back uh, between Wellington and Melbourne for $10. You could also grow an office tree. The permanence is questionable, but um, <laughs> it's nice to have a tree. In order to incentivize other businesses to do these things, we should also be preferring providers with better environment practices. Cloud hosting is likely to be the biggest contributor out of the providers that you use. Obviously, carbon cost isn't the only thing to think about here, but it's something that you should be aware of, especially if you're reporting your emissions. Google, Microsoft, and Salesforce, uh, who own Heroku, all off report and offset their emissions while AWS does neither. All four of these companies use amounts of electricity best described in terawatt hours, which for anyone familiar with amounts of electricity, that's heaps. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and that they've all made commitments to try to use 100% renewable energy. They do this by making purchase agreements with renewable generators. The problem is that they're not always in the same place where they use the electricity. So this is Google's map of where they've made renewable energy purchases. I'm not sure if you can see the map on there. Uh, I'm used to maps without New Zealand, but this doesn't even have Australia. <laughs> uh, and it doesn't have most of China. 
and it, it has about a quarter of Russia. So given that they do use electricity in that part of the world, there's a lot left to be desired in their 100% renewable energy statement. And the other companies that boast of using 100% renewable energy have pretty similar problems. These market mechanisms do exist in Australia. You can make PPAs and get LGCs in the way that you get RECs in the US or GOOs in the, in the EU. That's a lot of, you don't need to understand that, it's fine. Uh, just wanted to say all the acronyms. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's nothing stopping Google and Amazon from making agreements with renewable en energy providers here. Uh, there's just not the pressure from their customers or from regulators. So uh, yeah, talk to your AWS and G GCP salespeople and get Australia on this map if you can. So a lot of us work at companies that don't have departments full of policy wonks who can work through the GHG protocol. But there are small, smaller companies that are still giving, a, uh, giving it a red hot go. Uh, and there's people from some of these companies here. Uh, so Stripe has put together a really impressive environment policy and step-by-step -step work about how they cal calculated and offset their emissions. Able Tech in Wellington has put together some calculations in a way that anyone else can emulate. Uh, Sindor has gone the full carbon neutral route. And if your company is doing well around this, tell people. <laughs> so some of you might now be feeling the crushing weight of climate change sadness. This is a sadness that I know well. I thought that spending three months researching this talk would intensify this sadness, but I'm actually feeling more optimistic about the problem than I was. I'll tell you why, and maybe it'll alleviate your sadness as well. Climate change is leading to irreversible damage. We're going to have to make massive changes. But if we do make those changes, if we mitigate our emissions and adapt our lifestyles, we'll deal with it. The world is going to look really different in 100 years, but it looked really different 100 years ago as well. We're contributing to these problems, but we can contribute to solutions as well. We can reduce our emissions and build things to help other people reduce their emissions and adapt to a changing world. And there are lots of other smart, capable people working on this. People in Australia often excuse this country's terrible climate change policy with the relative size of its emissions. It doesn't matter what we do when China emits so much more. We don't have to settle for not being the absolute worst. <laughs> we shouldn't excuse ourselves because of our size. When we're small, we can try things out, see what works and model it for others. In tech, we can model for other industries how to be conscious about our impact. Thank you very much. I've got some resources and references up online, and find me later if you want to chat about what we can do, do about this. Thank you.